This installment of Middle East Dialogues features a conversation between Esra Ozyurek of the London School of Economics and Political Science and Nazla Ozkan, a PhD candidate in cultural anthropology and Middle East and North African studies at Northwestern University. Esra Ozyurek is a political anthropologist who studies how Islam, Christianity, secularism, and nationalism are dynamically positioned in relation to each other in Turkey and in Europe. She is the Chair of Contemporary Turkish Studies at the European Institute at the London School of Economics and Political Science. She is the author of Being German, Becoming Muslim, Race, Religion, and Conversion in the New Europe, and Nostalgia for the Modern, State Secularism, and Everyday Politics in Turkey. She is also the editor of The Politics of Public Memory in Turkey. Professor Ozyurek's visit to Northwestern was co-sponsored by the Cayman Modern Turkish Studies Program at the Buffett Institute for Global Studies. This interview took place on February 14, 2017, at Northwestern. You've worked on a wide variety of subjects such as secularism, Christianity, Islam, nationalism, memory, both in Turkey and in Europe. In your first book, Nostalgia for the Modern, you focus closely to Kemalist citizens in Turkey who define themselves as secularists and who were in fact worried about the increasing presence of Islam in Turkey's public sphere back in the 1990s. Your more recent work focuses on more religiously oriented individuals such as Christian converts in Turkey or Muslim converts in Germany. So when you look at your longer research trajectory, how do you see your initial research interests inform your later research interests from you know, maybe more secular oriented people to more religiously oriented people? Of course, not to produce the binary, but I was wondering how do you see them speaking to each other? Well, um, the focus of my research is the relationship between religion and politics, religion and power, let's say. So in that sense, I see both projects closely connected to each other. Mm -hmm. So we can, um, you know, Kemalism obviously is not religion, but we can see it also as public religion. Mm -hmm. In Turkey, so much spirituality was attributed to it and also the way people approach it. So I wanted to bring out that dimension in my first work. Mm -hmm. um, and I was looking at them as they were becoming um, increasingly marginalized, yet still um, holding on to some of their power. And in my later work, I'm looking at Muslims and what it means to be included um, into the mainstream and being excluded. Um, so in that terms, I see them um, as continuous projects. So your last book, Being German, Becoming Muslim, centrally deals with Islamophobia, which is on the rise with Donald Trump's recent attempts to ban citizens from seven Muslim majority countries from entering the US. You, in your book, you make an interesting discussion and say that there is not an agreement on how to define Islamophobia. There are people who compare Islamophobia to different forms of discrimination, such as racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism. So can you talk a little bit more about how people define Islamophobia differently and do they see a utility in using the term in terms of talking about discrimination against Muslims? Mm -hmm. Well, discrimination against Muslims or hatred towards Muslims or fear of Muslims, it has a long history, but the term Islamophobia itself is kind of new. It is since the 1970s or 1980s, it um, became popular. And I myself am not completely happy with it because, mm. you know, how it compares to anti-Semitism, to racism, why is it just phobia? Um, you know, so there are all sorts of questions around it, but at the same time, this is a phrase that we have. When people say it, we know what it means, mm. you know, so in that sense, I don't, you know, I think we're stuck with it <laughs> for, for the time being. Um, but defining Islamophobia, of course, um, has been a long process. The issue with that is 
if we compare it to anti-Semitism, this is a big comparison because they're both religious groups, um, minorities, especially in European context, there, there is a lot of similarities between anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Uh, but with anti-Semitism, there were lots of groups that were proudly anti-Semitic. There were parties. You know, so they said, you know, we're anti-Semites, we're proud mm. of it, and these are our, our policies. Mm. So you mm -hmm. could go to them and then look at their definitions of how they define anti-Semitism. But with Islamophobia, there is no one pretty much out there who says I'm proudly anti-Muslim, I hate Muslims, I'm an Islamophobic. It is more um, an attribution from us researchers. We say, oh, these people are Islamophobic, mm -hmm. and they say, no, no, we are not Islamophobes. Mm -hmm. So that is um, uh, one area. And also we now live in the post-Holocaust world. We have seen how, where racism can go and how bad it is. So people also will overtly say, no, we are not racist, but at the same time, they will be, um, um, you know, doing things, saying things, acting based on assumptions of racism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so these are some of the issues that make it difficult to talk about what exactly constitutes Islamophobia. Mm, because it is not, Islamophobia is not used by people who are actually Islamophobic, right? Like it's not a self identified term in that sense. Yes, that. You also make an interesting suggestion and you propose to compare Islamophobia to homophobia, mm -hmm. right? How does comparing these two broaden our understandings of the term? Mm -hmm. If we have to use it, yes. you know, if we are stuck yes. with it. Yes. Um, Islamophobia is very commonly compared to anti-Semitism. And, you know, in that, I feel like sometimes it comes to a stopping point or, um, or, or, or it is an overused um, comparison. Sometimes um, people um, get stuck in certain places. So I thought about, okay, what are some of the other hatreds that we can mm. talk about? And how can we also, um, especially in my work, as I look at converts to Islam, it is, and also looking at their marginalization. So I can already see that it is different from anti-Semitism. So there is a part of it that is racist, definitely. You know, I think Islam is um, inscribed on people's bodies. You know, mm. even if people are not religion, religious, if your name is Mustafa, you know, you have the darker skin, um, you know, the name, you look, you are marked as Muslim and you are discriminated, let's say, in the job market, in the housing market, all of this happens regardless of your belief. But also I looked at converts to Islam, you know, even if they are white, they are also subject to some sort of discrimination. And this is a choice that they have made. So I was mm. thinking about, um, the, in that sense, I feel like a comparison with homophobia is interesting because mm -hmm. there also the concept of choice comes up. You know, people who argue um, homophobia is a systematic discrimination, they argue no, homo people are born as homosexuals. And then the others who argue no, there is um, mm -hmm. not systematic discrimination or this is not a discrimination that we need to legally support and make life easier for, for homosexuals. They say, no, they chose it. So they didn't have to choose mm -hmm. it. And a similar argument is made with Muslims too. No, if people choose to be Muslims or not. So this is not racism. So we don't have to have affirmative action. So I thought um, in today's world, in today's uh, subjectivities, choice is really mm -hmm. important. So I was trying to bring in, uh, talk about how we can bring in choice into discrimination. What is the role of it? And mm -hmm. why is it okay to be discriminated when you choose something versus when you do not choose something? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's relevant, especially in terms of religion, because there is this Western idea about people choose their religions, right? Exactly. So it speaks to that kind of nuances. So again, in your Being German, Becoming Muslim book, you talk about how converts to Islam in Germany experience a sudden fall mm -hmm. in their status when you become Muslims, especially in a society where being Christian is considered as one of the most prevalent features of mm -hmm. being German. Mm -hmm. 
with conversion, they started to experience the um, antimism sentiments dominant in their society and they develop interesting ways to negotiate these tensions of a transformative German, potential. In especially actions, in Germany, a which transformative is increasingly potential. Especially in Germany, which is increasingly marginalizing and racializing Muslims. So how do you conceptualize this transformative potential? How do you think they will change the dominant structures of German society? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have to say that converts to Islam are a small group, so they will mm -hmm. not totally transform German society or the yeah. Muslim community, mm -hmm. but um, still by looking at a group that doesn't fit the norms or they um, transgress them, mm -hmm. um, it gives us clues to understand how the, um, these structures differences, boundaries are made, mm -hmm. right? That's a very classical anthropological move by looking at a group that doesn't fit, then you understand, okay, what are the categories that form this society? So if there's a division between being German and being Muslim, then what do German converts to Islam do to these things as they transform? Mm -hmm. Through their transformation or through their transgression, they make these categories. Um, so in that sense, they already challenge it by say, okay, one can be a German and a Muslim at the same time. And when they enter Muslim communities, they demand um, education in the German language. They make demands that people speak more German, for example. So already they change the Muslim community mm -hmm. and also the mainstream community as well. So you can have a German name, you can have German ancestry and you can be Muslim at the same time. So this is the transformation that they're doing. But at the same time, they end up reproducing these categories too. Mm -hmm. In my research, I have uh, found the way they talk about the, the way they talk about Muslims, the, they, the way they talk about Germans, they still talk as if, you know, these are essentially different categories. So Muslims have these characteristics, not because of their religion, but you know, ideas about um, if they lie, they get money from the state, that mm. they are lazy, they don't follow the rules. And they suggest they could overcome these deficiencies if they were good Muslims. But even while saying that, they reproduce these stereotypes about Muslims. Mm -hmm. And again, they say, well, Islam fits perfectly with Germans. Why? Because Germans don't lie, they are punctual, mm. they actually are rational. So in saying these things or acting uh, based on these assumptions, they would reproduce stereotypes about Germans and Muslims while um, transgressing these categories. Boundaries, yeah. So in a sense, you suggest that while they are embracing Islam, they also distance themselves from immigrant Muslims who are from the Middle East, mostly. Exactly. So can we then conclude that learning more about Islam or you know, even becoming Muslim is not enough for eliminating Islamophobia or like anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant sentiments which are very much mixed with each other? Yes, I mean, then this research points to characteristics of racism. So by mm. embracing the religion, you don't necessarily get over the racism. Mm -hmm. Racism works through its own dynamics in yes. society, its exclusionary mechanisms, the myths that it reproduces. So then it shows us how religion and race are connected, but at the same time, they're still two different things. Many analysts have viewed the results of recent US election and the Brexit vote as a global reaction against the devastating consequences of neoliberalism in the form of a right-wing pushback. Mm -hmm. So as a person who first-hand experienced the processes culminated in the Brexit vote, do you see similarities between these two cases or do you see nuances? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there are definitely differences but at the same time a global process is happening around the world right this mm -hmm. is a reaction to neoliberalism many working class groups feeling alienated this radical fall men feel um, like they have lost so much of their authority 
so that maybe their manliness is the only thing and white working classes they feel like their whiteness is the only thing that they want to hold on to mm. and um, this leads to xenophobia misogynism and we see parallel developments all around the world and it is hard not to think that they are connected and again you know in all of these uh, places people are voting for parties who are hoping they'll make them stronger but actually mm -hmm. um, end up hurting them the most so we will see how we'll get out of this um, cycle of you know isolation and groups turning into themselves hating each other yeah it definitely is a dark moment around the world it is it is and what is interesting in brexit is to me at least this anti-european sentiments right european immigrants are not welcome yes so that's such an interesting thing to see as part of this trend so it's maybe one of the nuances between these two cases i see yes i mean the uk maybe in that sense is quite similar to turkey that they have yeah. an imperialist nostalgia mm. that you know we used to be that empire we were so good, so how is it that now Brussels is telling us what to do? Um, no, so it looks they are more happy um, with people from their former colonies, from Commonwealth, in a way having immigrants who know their place, mm. rather than European immigrants, you know, who come at a more equal level. Um, so in, in that sense, I guess the US is different, that the US is also losing its imperial powers but it is not where the UK yeah. is. Yeah. yeah that colonial past is not present here maybe that's one difference in that sense. Yes or, or that the colonial present is still present mm -hmm. you know the US is still a major force around the world even though not as much as okay. let's say 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah and we haven't talked much about it in this interview, but you're also interested in memory. Mm -hmm. And your even more recent work is focusing on how Holocaust memory is being transformed. I mean, maybe not transformed, is, maybe it's not the right word, mm -hmm. but like how it is constructed in relation to Turkish and Arab immigrants mm -hmm. in Germany. Their senses of feelings about these um, stories of mm -hmm. Holocaust. Can you talk a little bit more about how do you see them interaction? Mm -hmm. How do you see them in interaction with mm -hmm. each other? Mm -hmm. So for me, yeah, yes, memory has always been central to my work. In, that, in this uh, work where I um, look at how Turkish and Arab background um, Germans interact with the Holocaust memory, um, this is again about inclusion, exclusion, and religion and state in a way. In this work, I see Holocaust memory as civil religion of Germany and also increasingly of Europe. And also in a way, I see this work as the mirror image of my other work where I looked at how uh, Germans become Muslim. And th in this work, I asked the question of if Muslims can be German and if they can, what are the ways in which this can be possible? So one way in which is engaging with the Holocaust memory, mm. um, taking the responsibility. And in my work, I'm also showing that it is possible up to a certain level, but at the same time, it is not fully possible. And in that way, it reflects my work on German converts to Islam, mm -hmm. about the possibility and impossibility of moving categories. Also, I think you make a really interesting argument about the feelings, right feelings and wrong feelings about these Holocaust memories. And you say that when Turkish German or Arab German immigrants fear while touring these Holocaust sites, Germans are kind of uh, worried about to face this feeling of fear because it tells something about the present context, right? So this distinction between past and present is so central for mm -hmm. memo for remembering Holocaust. Mm -hmm. 
Can you open that up a little bit? Because I think it's a really fascinating argument to understand this whole Holocaust discourse or historical understanding of Holocaust in Germany and maybe in Europe as well. So memory is always about the past, but it's always in the present. You know, past is totally lost to us. So any discussion of the past we have in the present is about the present. So a lot of the Holocaust memory discussion is also about the place of minorities again in Germany. Mm. Um, and the Holocaust memory as it is practiced now has the sense that you know, Germans have um, come to terms with their past, they have moved beyond it, you know, they had a horrible past and now they have come to terms with it. In many ways it is true, you know, especially as someone coming from Turkey where the Armenian genocide is still denied, mm -hmm. you know, you can see um, what a different kind of relationship to the past there exists. Yeah. But at the same time, looking closely to it, I also came to notice that even though there is a great sensitivity towards anti-Semitism um, and what kinds of consequences that it led to, um, the same kind of sensitivity about present day racism does not exist. And in a way, the memory mm. of the um, Holocaust is so big, of course, it is so uh, monumental that it makes it difficult to see much smaller everyday racisms. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I was interested in that dynamic, you know, how to come to terms with present day racism in the light of recognition of the Holocaust and what and how do racialized subjects today engage with that and how do mainstream mm -hmm. society engages with their fears. So that, um, that is the topic of my most recent work. Yeah, I think that's such a nice way of bringing Holocaust memory into the present and then maybe mm -hmm. trying to find the potential in that, right, to face the racism existing in contemporary Germany, for instance. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. Thank you so much yeah, thank for you. your time. Thank, thank you. you.